React Native allows developers to reuse front-end code between mobile platforms. A user interface component written in React Native can be used in both iOS and Android code bases. Since React Native allows for code reuse, this can save time for developers, in contrast to a model where completely separate teams have to recreate front-end logic for iOS and Android. React Native was created at Facebook. Facebook itself uses React Native for mobile development and contributes heavily to the open-source React Native repository. In 2016, Airbnb started using React Native in a significant portion of their mobile code base. Over the next two years, Airbnb saw the advantages and the disadvantages of adopting the cross-platform JavaScript-based system. After those two years, the engineering management team at Airbnb came to the conclusion to stop using React Native. Gabriel Peel is an engineer at Airbnb who was part of the decision to move off of React Native. Gabriel wrote a blog post giving the backstory for React Native at Airbnb, and he joins the show to give more detail on the decision. There's a lot in this episode. It was a really good one as, as far as uh, I'm concerned, and it really gives a lot of color to the advantages and the disadvantages of React Native. And just to be clear, this is not a show that's against React Native. Airbnb has a very specific use case, and it's a gigantic company, so it's not to say that React Native is something you should not use. In fact, we've done many shows about the advantages of React Native, and I think it's an incredible platform. So it's a great show, and, and it gives both sides of this story. Before we get started, we're hiring a creative operations lead. If you are an excellent communicator, please check out our job posting for creative operations at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jobs. This is a great job for someone who just graduated a coding boot camp or someone with a background in the arts who's making their way into technology. If you want to be creative and you want to learn more about engineering and you have an excellent work ethic, check it out at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jobs. Cloud computing can get expensive. If you're spending too much money on your cloud infrastructure, check out Doit International. Doit International helps startups optimize the costs of their workloads across Google Cloud and AWS so that the startups can spend more time building their new software and less time reducing their cost. Doit International helps clients optimize their costs. And if your cloud bill is over $10,000 per month, you can get a free cost optimization assessment by going to doit-intl.com slash se daily. That's doit-intl.com slash se daily. This assessment will show you how you can save money on your cloud. And Doit International is offering it to our listeners for free. They normally charge $5,000 for this assessment, but Doit International is offering it free to listeners of the show with more than $10,000 in monthly spend. And if you don't know whether or not you're spending $10,000, if your company is uh, that big, there's a good chance you're spending $10,000. So maybe go ask somebody else in the finance department. Do It International is a company that's made up of experts in cloud engineering and optimization. They can help you run your infrastructure more efficiently by helping you use commitments, spot instances, right sizing, and unique purchasing techniques. This to me sounds extremely domain specific. So it makes sense to me from that perspective to hire a team of people who can help you figure out how to implement these techniques. Doit International can help you write more efficient code. They can help you build more efficient infrastructure. They also have their own custom software that they've written, which is a complete cost optimization platform for Google Cloud. And that's available at reoptimize.io as a free service if you want to check out what Doit International is capable of building. Doit International are experts in cloud cost optimization, and if you're spending more than $10,000, you can get a free assessment by going to doit-intl.com slash sedaily and see how much money you can save on your cloud deployment. Gabriel Peel is a software engineer at Airbnb, and he is a writer of a blog post about 
React Native at Airbnb. Gabriel, welcome back to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you so much for having me. So Airbnb has been using React Native for developing mobile apps for the past two years. And I want to start from the beginning and get through some of the story of React Native at Airbnb. How were mobile apps developed before React Native was at Airbnb? Yeah, so so this is an interesting one. So when we go back to the earliest days of mobile at Airbnb, they really started in around the 2012 timeframe. And at that point, mobile was pretty young. Uh, we, we were just a website. And over time, we realized the importance of having a mobile app, not just for booking a listing, but also for travelers, because often when you travel, all you have is your phone. And so it was really important for us to have a really good mobile experience. So 2012, 2013 is when we started to build the early stages of our mobile apps, which then grew into about a 15-person team on each platform, Android and iOS, in, in the middle of 2016. Now, at that point, we were starting to see a, a huge influx of uh, mobile traffic. Our mobile usage was going through the roof. And it, it went from this tiny, tiny fraction of the business to something that was extremely important. And then teams were encouraged to make sure that their features worked on mobile, on Android and iOS. But with 15 people on each platform, we literally just didn't have enough people to build what we needed. And well, that team structure issue, that was the whole idea behind React Native is that React Native would give you reusable components that would allow for some communication centralization within different teams. So if you know you can you can sort of design a component and make it com- make it portable between Android and iOS and web, uh, that was sort of the goal of of React Native, if, if I understand it correctly. So it, so I'm sure when that when React Native came out, it was like oh that's that's our problem. Yes. So so I guess that there are two similar but different mantras that people take when they think about React. There is a learn once, write everywhere mantra, where you learn the React paradigm, you learn JavaScript, JSX, and and the ecosystem, and then you can write on any platform. And then there's write once, run anywhere, where you literally write the code once, and it runs on multiple platforms. And so in this particular scope of React Native, it's actually a little bit of both. And it's important to understand like why, why they're different and understand which one you're trying to glean the most value out of. So it started from the learn once, write anywhere paradigm. Because at Airbnb, you know, at that point, early on, we had about 15 Android and 15 iOS engineers, but probably well over 100 people in the company who knew React. Our entire website is React. It uh, is very successful for us, rewriting our website in React. And we've also built a lot of infrastructure and libraries and are highly leveraging the ecosystem around React. So we saw that as an opportunity to build on our existing native infrastructure, but then allow people who know React to contribute to mobile. And so that, that would be their, their learnings from web on mobile. That being said, over time, it becomes clear that because React Native is in fact React, it's not a fork of React, it's not a clone of React, it's actually React running on your phone. And so because of that, you, you literally can share a lot of code, you can leverage a lot of the same libraries. So we use things like Redux and, and a number of other industry standard libraries in the, in the React community. And although there's some organizational challenges in actually sh- starting to share code between web and mobile, we saw the potential to do that either by directly sharing code or by having the same person write the feature once on web and once on mobile because they could reuse a lot of their thought processes. So when you started using React Native, were you just kind of experimenting with it a little bit or did you make a, a really decisive decision to let's let's just go let's let's do it let's go all in on react native so it depends who you ask and and this is actually one of the more contentious uh, organizational challenges we had with react native and that so it was started as essentially an experiment i think it's really important in in the world of engineering to treat this everything like an engineering problem it has pros and it has cons and it's really important to understand the full set or as large of a set of pros and cons as you can in order to mitigate risk and help uh, have a smooth and uh, not rocky rollout. So that's really, really important. So it started kind of like an experiment. There were essentially two engineers, Leland Richardson and Spike Brem, who were very experienced React engineers. And they worked in partnership with some people on, on mobile, like myself and a few others. 
to to build out a product on mobile. So we built out it was your reservation alterations. That was the first thing we ever launched with React Native. So we started building it out in like July 2016, and then it launched in October. And so in that process, we had to build out a bunch of things like experimentation, internationalization, deep links, navigation, our design language, and a number of other things. But then things started to change really quickly around right around that same time. Because in November of 2016, we launched Experiences, which is so you can book something to do in a city and in addition to a place to stay through Airbnb. So this particular team had lots of web resources and not enough mobile resources to actually build out what they needed to before launch. And so that became this sort of pivotal moment for React Native because that team in particular just decided to go all in on React Native for their products prior to us ever launching the first one uh, for a, a, a really, really important and highly visible launch. And so this was a... It was an opportunity that had, it could have gone a number of different ways. Uh, it certainly wasn't painless. I think it was, it was kind of hectic getting that out the door. There was a lot of work to be done, a lot of long hours. But at the end of the day, it did launch. It launched on time. Did not launch bug free, but it did launch on time. And uh, it would not, they would not have been able to finish building out their feature set without pulling engineers off of other teams in order to launch on time. So it became this interesting case where one team kind of just, for it, their, their hand got forced into this direction and it ended up really dramatically accelerating the React Native adoption very early. Okay, so let me see if I understand correctly. So React Native comes out, different teams on Airbnb mobile development said, yeah, let's tinker around with this. Let's experiment with it. Let's do a few things, internationalization, et cetera. And then Experiences gets announced as a feature that we're going to build, and the Experiences team makes a very rational decision. We, we've got a lot of web resources. We've got fewer mobile resources. Well, let's see if we can go all in with React Native. Let's see what happens. They went all in with React Native, and they did ship on time. They had to pull people off of other teams, but but it sounds like it, it did get shipped okay. Do I understand things correctly so far? It launched. And I, I, with every launch, there are, you know, f few launches are perfect and smooth and bug free. And this was not one of those, just like others, but it, it went out the door. People were able to use it. People were able to book on it. So in a sense, it did allow them to get to their goal. And I, I sense that there were some, it sounds like there were some foundational things that as experiences was, was being built or as it was being released, you were sort of like, oh no, this is, there's something wrong here. So I, I think it's really important to to understand exactly, yeah, break it down a little bit further. So React Native is when you when you add React Native to an existing code base, you're especially if it's a larger one with a lot of infrastructure of its own, as ours was and still is, it's really important to think about what that interaction is going to look like and what kind of institutional infrastructure that you have to either recreate, rebuild, or bridge. And so in this particular situation, it was, it was kind of like a cat and mouse game where they're just in order to, in order to build a screen, you want to be able to leverage our networking stack. You want to be able, you, it was critical that we run experimentations. All the internationalization has to go through an internationalization pipeline. There's just no, there are no other options if we want to actually ship a product. We have to do that work up front. And so there was just a, a huge, a huge amount of work that had to be done to get from zero to one in the case of React Native. I mean, it was not it was not the sort of thing we could just tack on top and just write write one screen in isolation and ship it. It just simply that would never have been a good experience, and it would have hamstrung the teams that have cho would have chosen to use it. I think in in this particular case, because everything was happening so quickly, I think there was a combination of things that were made difficult specifically because of React Native, but also simply because we were tacking on a, a huge new platform and there was just uh, an incredible amount of work that had to be done, and that was just a matter of hours in in some in some cases well, you, you you and i were talking before the show about how now the main thing you're focused on is android infrastructure and you said something like eighty thousand lines of code in the android app Eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred thousand. okay right so you know and i'm sure that there's something proportional on on the ios side of things and it's like if you if you imagine the amount of infrastructure that has been built around managing an eight hundred thousand line android app 
uh, and I'm sure it wasn't 800,000 lines back when you were launching experiences, but it was probably something you know still tremendous. And you think about introducing the necessary build tools or what, whatever other supporting infrastructure you need to put into a mobile app to make React Native work, not to mention all of the organizational reconfiguration that you need to do in order to ship a feature with this new uh, hybrid platform, you're you're potentially incurring a lot of strange, uh, not strange, but fresh, fresh types of technical debt. Yeah. And, and then those things are going to need to be forever maintained as well. So when your company comes out with experimentation platform V2 or API V3, or starts rolling out graph, moving from REST to GraphQL, somebody has to always be there to keep React Native up to speed, or it's just going to fall further and further behind. So when experiences launched, and you were I guess you were having this realization that you did incur this fresh technical debt. What what was going through your head? Were you thinking I need to bring this up, or or you know we need to reconsider React Native, or or were you thinking we're going to have to like push, we're going to have to you know bring in a lot of support to make React Native work? Were you were you gung ho for React Native at that point, or were you starting to feel nervous about it? So it's important to consider this and a particular question like this that. One, just one thing I want to call out about React Native is that it's a incredibly polarizing topic. And there's no way around that. A lot of companies are choosing to use it and not choosing to use it. But almost in every case, there are people within an organization who are very pro React Native uh, and or cross-platform in general and very against it. So what the answer that you hear is going to uh, vary tremendously based on who you ask. From my personal perspective, I understood why React Native was the cross-platform framework that we chose. It made a lot of sense to be able to leverage our existing infrastructure and and talent here because we have a lot of it. That being said, I think experiences betting the farm on React Native was a huge risk. And I think that there were certain aspects in which they had to sacrifice the product quality as a result of jumping to React Native and going all in on it so quickly. And so I'm someone who I care deeply about product. So things like it has to be smooth, it has to be responsive, it has to it has to feel amazing to use. And we can achieve that with native. And so I would be worried of with React Native if I felt like we couldn't actually achieve that. So that being said, with React Native, surprisingly, we were able to get closer to that bar than most people would think is possible. So, so I worked closely with a couple of other engineers and we got things like shared element transitions working between native and React Native screens and an API that was canonical in React and also worked in iOS. Things like this, I think it goes to show that if you put in enough effort, you can actually overcome most of the technical challenges that may be associated with React Native. But one of the things that we discovered is that understanding how much effort is going to be needed is something that's very difficult for a number of reasons. So one of the big reasons is that React Native inherently is not just one platform, it's actually kind of three platforms baked into one. And so if you're working on React Native, most of the time you're living in JavaScript and React land, but you can't forget that it's running on Android and iOS under the hood. And there are times when when the, the native implementations kind of peek through or you have to dig down and understand the nuances of each platform in order to do something appropriately. And so that creates a challenge where if you're working in one platform, you can, you can learn that platform through and through. You can become an expert at it and you can understand exactly where to poke and where to prod and where to look uh, to, to make it do what it's a bend it to your will, essentially. But I've yet to meet an engineer who can do that effectively on three platforms at the same time. And so getting to some of these, the last five or, or 10% sometimes requires some explicit and intricate knowledge of a platform and just and being able to do that effectively in React Native is is a really hard problem, and I, I've yet to see an, an easy answer to that because it's at the end of the day, it's it requires understanding three platforms. We are all looking for a dream job, and thanks to the internet, it's gotten easier to get matched up with an ideal job. Vettery is an online hiring marketplace that connects highly qualified job seekers with inspiring companies. Once you have been vetted and accepted to Vettery, 
companies reach out directly to you because they know you are a high-quality candidate. The Vettery matching algorithm shows off your profile to hiring managers looking for someone with your skills, your experience, and your preferences. And because you've been vetted and you're a highly qualified candidate, you should be able to find something that suits your preferences. To check out Vettery and apply, go to vettery.com slash sedaily for more information. Vettery is completely free for job seekers. There's 4,000 growing companies from startups to large corporations that have partnered with Vettery and will have a direct connection to access your profile. There are full-time jobs, contract roles, remote job listings with a variety of technical roles in all industries. And you can sign up on Vettery.com slash SEDaily and get a $500 bonus if you accept a job through Vettery. Get started on your new career path today. Get connected to a network of 4,000 companies and get vetted and accepted to Vettery by going to Vettery.com slash SEDaily. Thank you to Vettery for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Okay, so what you're alluding to is the fact that in React Native, if you if you're just doing fairly basic app-based interactions, then React Native is mostly going to take care of it for you, and you can stay in JavaScript land, and everything, from what I've heard, React Native is, is pretty great for that, if you have fairly basic interactions. But once you get to really complex interactions, or something that needs to be highly performant, then you might need to dip down into the native code. So React Native uh, you know, is, is in this JavaScript land with this JavaScript bridge, and you might need to actually write Objective-C code or Swift code on iOS, or write Java code on Android, and therefore, if you need to duck down on a regular basis, I can see it being quite troublesome because... So, so help, help me understand, why, why wouldn't it work just to have, you know, you've got a bunch of React Native engineers, and maybe they do most of their development in JavaScript, and then occasionally they have to, you know, flag over the iOS expert to come over and help them with their low-level feature. Was, we, do you have to dip down into iOS code, into Swift code, or, or, or Objective-C code more frequently than than you would have hoped is that what happened so i i think the answer is a little bit complicated so i think the to answer the first part of that question about react native engineers sometimes needing to pull over the android or ios engineer for help so so there's there's two parts of that there's one is understanding where exactly the problem is and so in react native there's a lot of moving pieces there's the react platform there's the react native stuff in javascript there's the bridges to native. There's the native implementation in Java and Objective-C. And then there are native libraries such as Yoga that handles the layout and a few other things as well, as well as the, the JavaScript runtime itself. And so you just there's a lot more black boxes in the React Native world. And so if it were simple to always pinpoint exactly why something is behaving the way that it is, I think you could make the case that you could do that. But but it's we encountered so many situations where something would happen and it's just almost unfathomable how you would even go about debugging it because it could be coming from so many different places and you could certainly you can have one you have one debugging environment on the javascript side and you have another debugging environment on the android and ios side and then god forbid if your if your issue is some uh, somehow layout related or you're having layout performance issues in yoga figuring out how to debug that is is can be a nightmare and these are these are situations that you don't really encounter on native very frequently. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about that tooling that you developed. So, as React Native became something that was a central part of both the Android and the iOS apps, what tooling did you have to include to help with things like debugging, to help with things like build time? Uh, I don't I don't know what other issues you have to solve at the library or tooling level, what kinds of standardization did you have to put in place? Yeah, so so we had a fairly complex build, a Gradle file and iOS build file on each platform that sort of knew how to use Watchmen to watch for changes in JavaScript and build the bundle locally. So we don't check in the JavaScript bundle for React Native into our repo uh, because it's fairly large. It's split up into 
split bundles and and it changes frequently so it would just be a lot of stuff to commit to the repo so it gets generated on on the fly on each person's computer whenever it changes and so we had to build an infrastructure on that and make sure that the caching works for that we also you know there are some complications on how to handle react native libraries that that have native components so uh, on android so on, on, on ios it's a little bit complicated because uh, we use cocoa pods on ios and then you have to do some weird sim linking where you sim link some cocoa pod sources into node modules or vice versa and then on the android side it's it's a little bit more frustrating for us at least because or at least a lot of the android community is used to using gradle and just and or they use Gradle and they publish most libraries to Maven. So you can simply add one line of code in your Gradle file and it, and it generally works quite well. But a lot of React Native libraries require you to uh, like link the source from node modules. So you install your node module, npm install, whatever, and then you have to in your Gradle file link to that source there, which is fairly atypical and a non-standard if it goes against everything else that you do. So we, we actually wound up like having an internal Maven repo where we had to like get libraries and then like republish them internally. And it, it caused little things like that, caused all kinds of pain and overhead in random places that you wouldn't really expect. What were the organizational consequences of these changes to build time and debugging? How did it affect the overall product development? And maybe you could you could Give us a, a point in time here. Where are we in time right now? Like after Experience is launched, was React Native continuing to to be first class citizen, or was this when you were starting to have doubts? Give me a little more context. So yeah, I think it's important to just call out how how big of a role React Native played in our mobile development. This is something that, that I think there was a big misunderstanding of among the the community. So at at the point where we launched Experiences, because it was a big important launch for us. Uh, most of experiences was React Native and there wasn't much else in React Native at that time. And so, but that amounted to roughly 20% of our engineering work at that point in time. And then after that, some of the experiences were kind of stabilized. It wasn't quite as intense there, but then some other teams ramped up on it. And over time, we saw a fairly stable cohort of people that, can, that amounted to roughly 15% of mobile engineers that were working on React Native at any given time. And it never really grew to much more than that. And so somehow, whether it be our, you know, us talking about React Native externally, I think the, the misinterpretation of us being 100% React Native or moving from Native to React Native somehow became the, the thought in the industry. But, but in fact, it, it's something we continued in parallel. It, it, again, it kind of for about 15%. On the infrastructure side, we had, it was myself and Leland Richardson working full time on the React Native infrastructure for 2017. And that's about the same number of engineers we had each on Android and iOS that were purely focused on infrastructure. So about six total plus, a, like, plus about two or three more who work on native builds and CI. But it was never much more than that. So medium sized effort overall, but certainly not 100% of our app. And so how did that affect the organization? Like, how were you feeling organizationally about the impacts of React Native? I think it depends who you ask. So for teams that decided to not use React Native, I think there was actually very little impact. So it was things like I mentioned, like the building the JavaScript asset locally. So that, that added sometimes a minute or, or maybe two or three minutes, just a clean build every once in a while. When necessary, I think there are things we could have done to make that a little bit faster, but that was probably the, the that was the majority of the extent to which they had to deal with React Native. Then again, there were other teams who basically invested 100% in React Native, and from when they started working on it until when we worked with them to to work on moving away from it, they didn't have to hire a single Android or iOS engineer. That being said, it wasn't that was not to say they never had any work in native Android or iOS. Uh, many of those engineers had some experience on one platform or the other, but also part of the reason why Leland and I worked full time on React Native infrastructure was that we provided a significant amount of support. So we made ourselves available to other teams to help them when they were confused, when they were stuck, or when they needed to to have some native work done. This can be a challenge organizationally because people, different teams have different incentives and stakeholders, and it's really important to understand that 
uh, in a world like this, if you're going to have a team that, that's ready to write bridges or help or debug or me provide mentorship, it's really important to understand that that team, like what part of that team's incentives need to be aligned such that they're, they're willing to invest that time directly and almost in a, a randomized way because it can come in at any time for other teams that might need it. So that, that understanding between the teams of, of help is something that needs to be understood by the organization or otherwise one team is essentially doing charity work for another team and it, they'll, they'll wind up frustrated or wind up, in, in worst case, resentful having to do free work essentially for another team. Okay, so uh, before we talk about migrating away from React Native, I, I want to give my caveat as well that I, I think React Native is an amazing project. I've done you know, I think 20 or 50 or something shows on React, definitely not 50, but I've done a lot of shows on React Native, and I think it's a great product, uh, project. It's really exciting, and and every company is not Airbnb. So, you, like, you published this, this blog post about moving off of React Native at Airbnb. That doesn't mean everybody should be off of React Native. Airbnb is a really big company. You've got 800,000 lines of code. And also, by the way, you're in a very unique business situation where Airbnb has one of the biggest moats in in technology like you've got a huge moat and you kind of from a business perspective or from a technology perspective like i think right now airbnb is really in the phase of like let's let's like get our house in order and let's do very straightforward i mean the business model is so good that it's like we can just do kind of the boring things on the engineering side and the business will work really well i'm not i'm not saying that's what you were doing here or what you had to do i think it's it, I don't know. You you could certainly go that way and 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 make a good business. You don't really have to do anything super fancy on the on the engineering level, other than scale, which is fancy in and of itself. I'm not sure I agree with that. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I I'm the business is doing well, and and that's always great. But I think for us, like we we are more so than a lot of companies, we're very design first. The co-founders of this company are designers. The ability to create really incredible experiences has been really core to the DNA of Airbnb since the beginning. And the decision to move from away from React Native was not even directly a result of us meeting or not meeting product goals or our ability to, to achieve those. It was simply a matter of, of practicality. I mean, I tried to outline it in as much detail as in the blog post series as I could, but I think that there were just some challenges technically and organizationally that such that the benefit that we were getting out of it was no longer worth the investment. And based on the people who are working on it, both uh, myself and Leland on the infrastructure side, as well as the product engineers, I just saw that uh, there was a lot of opportunities to make Native even better. And at the same time, I think React Native was actually going fairly well. And the teams that there were teams that very, were very were able to use it very effectively and, and to their advantage. But the overhead of maintaining the infrastructure, both maintaining it on its own, as well as sort of the opportunity cost of those people then working back native, like contributing their work directly to native Android and iOS yeah. just wasn't worth it. And so now like uh, now that there's more, uh, more resources on Android and iOS again, we're actually seeing some material improvements in, in both the like things like build times, some new open source libraries. I'm really excited about something that we're working on on Android that we're coming up with very soon. And so, and in fact, some of the principles of that were inspired by some of the things that work well in React Native. But again, it's not, it's not about us just like settling down into the easy path. I think it's just a matter of uh, the opportunity cost was very high. It's a very polarizing subject. And, you know, there is, and there wasn't really a, a path for React Native to ever be more than 15 or 20% of mobile here. Right. Okay. So I think I'll just shut up and, and ask you this question. When you, were, when you decided that you were going to move from React Native to just to sunset React Native and move to purely native mobile platforms, what was your forecast for how that would change the build and the engineering, how that would make you move faster? Yeah, so, you know, at, at the time when we decided to sunset it, we had about two, two uh, engineers working in infrastructure and, again, about 15% of mobile engineers. And we looked, you know, Leland and I, we sat down and we kind of looked at all the teams that were using it. And then we, we did some like forward road mapping to figure out like what teams may start using it in the future, what new opportunities are opening up that it may be a good fit for. And we didn't see, we didn't see that growth potential. And the thing about cross-platform and both Android and iOS, but also building like robust infrastructure to do things like 
code sharing between web and mobile, and then also building infrastructure around code push, which we haven't talked about yet, but would enable over-the-air updating. All of those things are highly leveraged based on its usage. And without significant usage across our, our mobile products, it, didn't, it no longer justified the, the investment. So it really just came down to the fact that there wasn't a real opportunity for it to become much more than 15 or 20 percent of mobile. 15 to 20 percent of the mobile code base? You mobile mean? code base, the number of engineers contributing to React Native versus Android or iOS. Okay. When you decided to do this, or when you proposed it, was that divisive as well? Or at that point, were people organizationally realizing the, the, the costs that were being incurred? So I think I would say it's gone about as smoothly as you could have hoped it would. Certainly, like I mentioned, there were a few teams that had really effectively leveraged React Native. They had effectively gone all in on it and resourced their team appropriately with people who knew React Native at the expense of Android and iOS engineers. So it took a little bit of, of additional work, and we've provided some additional resources and, and hands-on mentorship and uh, and actually, in some cases, direct help to, to rewrite some of these features in Native. But at the end of the day, I think that once the kind of the landscape was outlined to them, it was it really only it was a fairly understandable decision for most teams. And then for the last few that really depended on it, um, I think I think they understood fairly quickly, and and there hasn't been much pushback since. By the way, what are the things that you have to to duck down into Native code to do? On, on Android or iOS, if you're using if you're using React Native, like how often do you have to do that? So it, it depends on, on what you're building. But some of the things that, that we bridged were on the infrastructure side, there were things like our networking stack, experimentation, internationalization, deep links, navigation. And then on the on the, the sort of the product code side, it was things like geofencing, it was things like maps, video views, Lottie and a few other a few other things like that. So uh, some of these cases, some of those cases are wrapping views, but they can be quite complex. Uh, let's take the the video and maps example. So they're they're very very complex. They have a lot of functionality. Sometimes it depends on the hardware, and it can be frustrating sometimes when you start or you're testing React Native on iOS. You write it and everything looks good. You go to Android and it doesn't work exactly the same. Now this is a very frustrating situation because the whole point of React Native is that it should just work on both platforms. But we found very frequently, and you know, in the case of React Native Maps, that, that was one of our own libraries that you know, I think we could have done a better job maintaining, but takes an incredible amount of time and energy to do so, and is uh, quite a complex product. When you find that you have a bug on one platform or another on a React Native, Native library, it's very frustrating, and it's very common. So we found that many of these libraries on React, on React Native were written by an engineer or engineers who were very familiar with one or two of the three platforms, but frequently lagged in in one of them. And this is to be expected, right? If you're one engineer writing an open source library, how could you possibly write perfect code across all three platforms? It's just these unicorn engineers simply don't exist in the world. And so as a result, you find that there's often significant code quality issues on at least one of the platforms. And so that's an example of when things go to native and you know some Sometimes it's those are things we built in house, and sometimes they're in third party libraries. How did the when you were in the thick of it, when you had, uh, or I guess you still do have re large scale React Native infrastructure? But how does it affect releases? So for the most part, React Native was the pure release process. React Native didn't have a big impact on. So we we shipped a bundle with the app, and it didn't. We didn't update it during the life of a of an app in the wild. Towards the end of our React Native lifetime, we were working on some code push infrastructure that would allow us to update that React Native bundle over the air. We actually got fairly far, and, and we had an entire rollout plan that would have uh, had several phases going from hot fixes and cherry picks to fixing major issues to eventually getting to a world where we, we could feasibly see a world where we have continuous deployment on mobile. And, and that's an incredible world. It's simply, it's not possible with native apps, with the review process. And so it's a beautiful promise, but uh, it would have taken a lot of work to get there, not just technically, but also also organizationally and understanding when you when you do have discrete app releases and then a continuously updating bundle, you there are a lot of things you have to consider. You have to safeguard it in a lot of ways with uh, automatic rollbacks and minimum versions and things like that to ensure that it has the same native API uh, to ensure that, I mean, you simply 
you can't test a new bundle across every app version manually. You can't send that through a QA process. So we, we had to think about some of those problems ahead of time. So I think the community will continue to work on this problem. And it's, it's something that React Native enables, which I think is very cool. We didn't get there. Also in the release process, we had to make sure that we, we could understand crashes in the wild. So JavaScript crashes by themselves just bubble up as JSC exceptions on native. And so we had to do a little bit of additional crash handling to make sure we caught the actual crash. We uploaded that to Bugsnag, which is what we use for crash analytics, and then properly make sure that source maps were uploaded as well. So, so there was a fair amount of effort, and we actually we had to work with Bugsnag to make sure that they supported JavaScript source maps in addition to native ones to make sure that that all got wired up. And it also introduced a new opportunity for our own infrastructure to fail. So I think we had one or two releases early on where some of our, our wiring that connects the React Native crash to a normal bug snack crash and is properly source mapped and things like that, that, that broke a couple times because there was just a lot of moving pieces there. And so we, we did see more instability there than we, did, than we saw in native. In addition, for you Android engineers out there, you may be able to sympathize with this, but you, we wound up with just so many random OEM devices that crash randomly on certain versions of Android or in certain regions. We're, we're, dealing, we're still dealing with this really nasty crash. It only occurs on about like six or eight different Samsung devices on a specific version of the software. And we keep buying these devices. We're like custom flashing them with these ROMs and we cannot reproduce these crashes that occur so specifically on certain devices. And we've seen a number of these, like not just one or two, but like over, over you know, since we've launched React Native, we've probably accumulated tens or hundreds of thousands of individual crashes from these super obscure native library loading in the middle of React Native on, a, on Lollipop, on Samsung or Huawei. They're just mind numbing how to figure out how to fix them. Test Collab is a modern test management solution which integrates with your current issue manager out of the box. For all development teams, it's necessary to keep software quality in check. But testing is complex. There are various features to test, there's various configurations and browsers and platforms. So how do you solve that problem? That's where Test Collab comes in. Test Collab enables collaboration between software testers and developers. It offers wonderful features like one-click bug reporting while the tester is running the tests, collaboration on test cases, test executions, test automation integration, and time tracking. It also lets you do a detailed test planning so that you can configure platforms and browsers and configurations or any variables in your application and divide these tasks effortlessly among your team for quality assurance. All of the manual tests run by your team are recorded and saved for analysis automatically, so you'll see how many test cases passed and failed, with plenty of QA metrics and intelligent reports which will help your application's quality. It's very flexible to use and it fits your development cycle. Check it out on testcollab.com slash SE daily. That's T E S T C O L L A B dot com slash S E daily. Testcollab.com slash S E daily. We've talked about the debugging process, the tooling. Pro, the debugging process is difficult. The amount of tooling that you have to include is, is can be difficult. And the fact that you have to write JavaScript in for a lot of that changes the team structure, it changes communication. What are some other subtle problems or changes that you had to make to the process of writing the mobile application due to the fact that you had adopted React Native? Okay, I'll give you a, a, a good example. So... Take Android. Uh, all right, I, I, there are a couple examples. Okay, so so we have Android. On Android, it does this peculiar thing where it will sometimes kill you the process of your app in the background, ask you to save some state in a per parcelable bundle, and then actually restore your app in a new process to uh, make it feel faster. So you can store things like the ID of a product page, and then which you can use to refetch it. It'll also recreate synthetically recreate a backstack and whatnot, so that 
it, even though your app was killed, it kind of feels like it wasn't. So this is really cool, and, and subtle things like this can help improve the time to interactive. It can bring the user back to where they were. It's, it's a good user experience. On the React Native side, we were using Redux to store our state. Now, Redux is just a JavaScript object that's floating in space. There's simply no way to reliably persist that in this parcelable bundle. We, try, we thought about a number of different options, like we could go through that and figure out maybe which parts of it are persistable and only persist those, or marking certain things as persistible, but then you have a React engineer who like, doesn't really understand Android well enough, and knowing the right places to do that is, is a nightmare. And if you only persist some things and not others automatically, you can actually wind up in a super broken situation where you've only restored half your state, but, but it's in a some logical state that makes no sense. So. Unfortunately, we just had to resort to, we, we did a little hack to determine if we were in a different process, and we just finished all of our React Native activities. So we basically just blew away all that behavior. It's really unfortunate, and I haven't heard of any good solutions to that. So, so that was one thing. Uh, another thing that was pretty tricky was uh, figuring out how to handle text inputs and a scrollable screen. So one of the things you need to make sure you do is if you touch a text input that's below the top of the keyboard, you need to scroll that screen to bring the text input into view. And this is extremely tricky. iOS makes it a little bit easier. They just have, you know, there's one keyboard, there's one way to handle it, and you can more or less make that work on iOS. But then on Android, there's, you're starting, there's two top level options. Sometimes uh, basically you have to configure an activity on Android. You tell it what to do when, when a keyboard pops up. You can tell it to either do nothing or you tell it to resize the window to make room for the keyboard. And so uh, I did this over a year ago now, so I, I'm trying to remember the specifics, but I, I had probably spent two straight weeks kind of dealing with understanding the window on Android versus iOS and understanding when the keyboard was up and taking into account that on Android, you can kind of have any number of different keyboards. You can have one that's like split on the left and right side of the screen. You can have one that's floating. And there are so many different configurations for the way keyboards can work on Android, plus different heights of autocorrection rows and additional padding and things like that. So something simple like a screen with a form, like a login and a password, or maybe a, some other form, and having a text input field and making sure that it does the right thing with the keyboard, all of a sudden takes two weeks when you didn't expect that to happen. What's the roadmap for sunsetting React Native? What's your plan for transitioning teams off of this technology? So we... Prior to announcing it to the rest of the company, we sat down with the engineering manager of every single team that's working on React Native to understand what the impact of it was. And then we, we have a spreadsheet now internally where we have all the React Native projects and their owners and their, their, their process of moving away from it. I can speak more on the Android side because that's what I'm more familiar with. But I, I think the teams have been very, very, very cooperative and, and I'm very thankful for that such that they all are making sure that they have resources on Android and iOS to move away from it. So at a high level, we agreed to essentially maintain support for React Native through 2018 and maybe a little bit into 2019. Basically, we're saying, hey, like this way, we threw this at you really quickly. We don't want to randomize your current roadmap. And so we're going to make sure it doesn't break for at least a year, a year and a half. But after that, you should really start to move away from it because we're not going to be putting as much effort into maintaining the infrastructure. So that was one side of things. On the other side, on, on the Android side, we've used this opportunity of moving away from React Native, but also doing things like adopting Kotlin, which we've done very well this year. We've gone from about 0 to 80% of new code in Kotlin in 2018 alone. Um, but we've, we've used this opportunity to kind of take some of the best aspects of the, the functional reactive nature of React, and we've built this really nice Android Kotlin library or framework that leverages some of the basically a lot, a lot of the common things you already do in screens, and it it wraps up some of these patterns into a really nice framework that's both fast to develop in, but also it'll feel familiar for people who are used to React Native because it has some similar concepts. So, do you have any advice for people regarding React Native? So, who should use React Native? Who should not use React Native? or I don't mean to make you prescriptive, maybe you just want to talk about specific strategic decisions, but can you help people vet this technology? Yeah, so this is the golden question. Should I use React Native or not? And I refuse to give a specific, you should use React Native or you shouldn't, but this is what I would say. First of all, doing React Native does not 
preclude you from ever having to do native Android or iOS. So there will, unless you hire people who explicitly have to do that, just be aware that if you do React Native, you will need to jump into Android or iOS fairly frequently, depending on what you're doing. And the second one is that when React Native works, it is amazing. Like I saw, we had a couple teams that had really good experiences with React Native and the, the productivity and the speed with which they were able to move was like simply off the charts. Like between hot module reloading, which actually works reliably, you write a line of code and it shows up on Android and iOS in like one or two seconds. I think that's really incredible. But what you wind up with is these, what uh, I call landmines. So everything is going swimmingly well, and then you hit a little landmine. So I'll give you an example of one. Uh, we had one instance where sometimes on certain phones, even in particular, the Pixel was particularly notable for this. Randomly, we didn't feel like we had made any significant changes. We, one out of 10 times or so, all React Native screens would render white. They would never render. And we didn't know why. Everything seemed fine. It was initializing. It was hitting the JavaScript, but it just simply wouldn't show up on the screen. And we were pulling our hair out, trying to reproduce it reliably, figure out what was going on. And after, I would say, a solid week of multiple engineers going heads down, trying to figure out what was going on, we discovered that we had removed the initialization of Fresco. So Fresco is React Native's image loading library to load images from a network. At Airbnb, we use Glide, which is basically, it's, it's a similar library, but instead of using theirs, we've always used Glide, and so we just wrapped the image tag in React Native with our own image view. But the React Native library has Fresco out of the box, and so we, we had that included. All we did was remove the initialization of that. And it randomly caused, on certain phones, some screens to never render in React Native. To this day, we have no, absolutely no idea what the connection there was. But it spent multiple engineers all of a sudden had to spend like an entire week trying to figure out how to make this work again. Because it was a release blocker. Because screens were simply not rendering. So this was, this was really, really bad. Other issues, like the keyboard thing that I mentioned, I think you, you're like, oh, it's just a simple form. And you, make, you, you write the components for the form in like an hour, and then you spend two weeks trying to make it scroll above the keyboard. So things like that are, were, were really, really difficult for us because it makes it really hard to forecast how long things take. Or you end up giving up, and, and, and you, even though it's technically possible to make it do what you want, the amount of effort it is to, to figure out how to solve that landmine is not worth the investment. So I don't have an answer for this. And I think teams like... Teams just need to be aware that this is the case. Teams often will do like a prototype and their prototype will go really well and they'll be like, great, React Native is the best thing ever. And then as soon as they try to, to take it the last 10 or 15% to production ready is when they encounter all these problems. The other thing that I would I'd say is extremely, extremely important is that React Native requires significant and continuous investment in infrastructure. So I'll give you an example. So we, we, have, we maintain a fork of React Native at Airbnb. We don't want to do this, but I'll walk you through the practicality of the situation. We wanted, we, we really, really wanted to get our screens to have better accessibility. This is just one, one of many examples. But React Native accessibility support is lacking. This is another case where you think everything is great. You're all like, oh, I'll just make it accessible. All the APIs exist on Android and iOS, but, but they're not plumbed all the way through the React Native uh, lead yoga and, and view system. And so you have to end up building it yourself. So we went ahead, we built it ourselves. But that change had to go into React Native Core. We could, of course, React Native being an open source platform, we could have gone to the Facebook repo, we could have put up a pull request, got it approved, merged it, but then we would have to wait four weeks for it to go into the next release and then run that update locally. So the turnaround time for that would probably be six plus weeks plus many, many additional hours. So sometimes we do that in parallel to also cherry picking that onto our own fork. So now what happens? We, we have some commits on our fork. In fact, over the two years, that number grew to about 50, 50 individual commits. And again, like we don't love the situation. We would love to just get it back into React Native, but sometimes when you just need to get your work done, you have to do things a certain way. And so now every time there's a new React Native upgrade, which is once a month, we have to manually cherry pick 50 commits back on top of the tree. And of course, React Native is moving very quickly. It's progressing. And so very, very frequently we encounter merge conflicts or like just sometimes they're small, but sometimes like the entire file's changed. The entire file is missing or the entire, you know, the entire library is, you know, totally uprooted from underneath you. 
So you wind up in this situation where you basically get stuck. So we're on React Native uh, 0.46 now, I think. And I'm fairly certain that we'll never be able to upgrade React Native ever again at Airbnb at this point. This is not a good situation. And it's something that it's very, very easily easy to accidentally find yourself in if you invest heavily in React Native. So sometimes I've heard of you know individual teams thinking that React Native is good for them. But you really need to take a holistic look at what its impact is and what its continual maintenance is going to look like because it's way, way more than a lot of people think it is. Final question. We just did a couple shows about Flutter, and Flutter's pretty cool. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it. What do you think about the potential of other cross-platform frameworks, either for Airbnb or otherwise? Yeah, so this is a lot of people have been asking this. Oddly enough, I feel like like Flutter, with good reason, is, has been very popular. The, the Xamarin folks are so passionate about their framework, so hats off to you guys for just loving it publicly so much. But for whatever reason, that was notable for Xamarin. But um, no, for Flutter and other frameworks, I think, I think it's great that the, the community is trying to solve this problem, right? I, I think there's billions of dollars annually wasted writing the same thing on Android and iOS. Completely that, wasted. Yeah, exactly. Literally you're trying to write the same thing. And if there are differences, trying to understand why they're, why they're subtly different. So I think that this is a real problem, and I think it's great that people are putting in effort to solve them. I think people really love, seem to be really enjoying Flutter. I think that it's really important to understand that even, even if they solve some of the technical problems, um, maybe, maybe the performance is better, maybe the IDE is better, the language you like more, you're still going to have a lot of the same organizational problems. Plus, you lose the entire reason why at least we chose React, which is we have a lot of people who write React. We, we, had a, we have, at the time when we started React Native, we probably had three times as many people in the company who knew React uh, and JavaScript than we knew, than people who knew Android and iOS combined. So I think that's a really important point. And it being React is so beneficial because when something doesn't work, you can Google it and you can find your Stack Overflow answer. You can find a GitHub open source project with thousands of stars that work. I think that these are incredibly important points that that and you would lose a lot of that by going to Flutter. It, and you know, I'm not going to say I wouldn't say that Google is definitely going to stop investing in Flutter, but I think that that there is more of a risk of Google stopping to invest in Flutter because they have they've built fewer internal apps with Flutter than than Facebook has with React Native. I know Facebook has dozens if not maybe even hundreds at this point of teams internally that use React Native. You know, it's they're, existential. They're, yeah, I, their, their app is huge. And so like it may even still not be a huge percentage of their overall app, but it's enough that they have to continue to invest in it. And the community has clearly invested a lot in it. So, so that's really important. I also think that some of the... Facebook published a really good blog post right around when we published ours about some of the improvements that they're making to React Native. Like they're, they're going to make it easier to write synchronous code between Native and React Native. And so while that sounds like it may only be useful in a niche case, it enables some extremely critical things, like for the first time, they can properly wrap Recycler View and UI Collection View from React Native to Native. And so that is absolutely huge, and it's going to solve one of the biggest pain points between the two. Also, the fact that everything is wrappable, I think that's a, a fairly big difference from Flutter. So you know, I built Lottie for Android, for example, and getting it to work in React Native is trivial. You just In, in an hour, you can write a wrapper and you can make it work. But if you wanted to get that to work in something like Flutter with its own view system, then you would actually have to write your own renderer again. And so you, you know, that could be a landmine, for example, that could happen in the future. So it's really important to consider it holistically. And like, what do you, you know, it might solve some problems, it's going to introduce others, and it's certainly going to share a lot of the same problems as uh, with React Native. On the Airbnb side, I think, you know, we, we really invested in React Native specifically because because of our infrastructure and our, our expertise with React. And I, I think that that was our shot right now to do cross-platform. So I really don't anticipate us adopting Flutter or Xamarin or any of these cross-platform frameworks anytime soon. Certainly not, at least until React Native is actually out of the code base, which is probably another year or two out. So. Okay. Well, Gabriel, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. This has been uh, a really interesting and instructive topic i think you know people really responded to your article and and found a lot of value in it and i think it's awesome that 
you talk you were willing to talk about it and you know it's obviously like you said divisive and and kind of a, a touchy subject but i mean when it comes down to it we're all just trying to build stuff and we're just trying to share information on how to build stuff at least at the the engineers in the room maybe you know the vendors less so the uh you know the <laughs> ceos in some case less so but you know from the engineers, we just want to know how to build stuff faster and more efficiently, and and I think your article went a long way to helping people better understand the the pros and cons of of using React Native. So so thanks for writing the article and thanks for coming on the show to discuss it. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Today's episode of Software Engineering Daily is sponsored by Datadog, a monitoring platform for cloud scale infrastructure and applications. Datadog provides dashboarding, alerting, application performance monitoring, and log management in one tightly integrated platform so that you can get end-to-end visibility quickly. And it integrates seamlessly with AWS, so you can start monitoring EC2, RDS, ECS, and all your other AWS services in minutes. Visualize key metrics, set alerts to identify anomalies, and collaborate with your team to troubleshoot and fix issues fast. Try it yourself by starting a free 14-day trial today. Listeners of this podcast will also receive a free Datadog t-shirt. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Datadog to get that fuzzy, comfortable t-shirt. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Datadog. Wow. Wow.